to have a closer look at the legacy here of Margaret Thatcher. Joining us in the studio is Neil Ferguson. Neil is respected historian and professor of history at Harvard University. Well, Neil, it was, you know, something which wasn't a total surprise, but having said that, you know, it did still, of course, surprise us all. And I think it did take a lot of people, you know, uh, uh, time to reflect again. And I, I think history's perhaps been kinder, do you think, to her than actually it would have been uh, if you looked at her during her time? Well, at the time Margaret Thatcher was forced to resign back in 1990, uh, British opinion certainly was uh, hostile to her, including British Conservative opinion. After all, she was got rid of by her own party because they were sure she would not be able to win another election. I was one of those Thatcher loyalists who, who mourned her departure. And I was certain the night that she resigned that really Britain's hopes of uh, fully reforming its economy and transforming itself the structures had been dashed. of the economy as you wrote about I, as well. Yeah, and I felt that, that, that Thatcher's work was about half done by 1990. She, she'd done the things that you mentioned, the privatization, selling uh, council homes to, uh, to the uh, inhabitants so that they could become property owners. She transformed the inflation picture. Remember, back in the 70s, inflation in the UK peaked at about 27%. Uh, you also had a chronic problem of labor unrest. In a single month in 1979, the UK lost 12 million days to strike action. Well, she addressed all of those problems, but there was a lot of unfinished business in 1990. Unfinished business, for example, in the healthcare system, unfinished business in the educational system, and she was also fighting a losing battle against Europe. But hadn't she lost touch? That was the point at that stage with the poll tax, particularly the community charge. Uh, the poll tax was one of those unforced errors that, that really came about what, because she it? had taken her yeah. eye off that ball. The Conservatives had never really been able to figure out what they wanted to do about local government finance, and the poll tax was a bad idea that slipped its way into the manifesto. She took her eye off the ball because her eye was another ball. That ball was Europe. Remember, in the final phase of her career, she was fighting a losing battle against her own cabinet on the issue of British membership of the European exchange rate mechanism. Almost her last major speech on Europe was the famous no, no, no speech. Jacques on Delors. the Delors plan yeah. for a federal Europe. Now, she was completely right about that. I mean, look at it now. What a mess the Europeans are in because of the single currency. What a disaster the whole project for a European federation has turned out to be. And yet she was overthrown partly because of her opposition on that issue. She was dead right. OK, Neil, you say that. Europe's a mess. So is Britain right now. Well, a lot has happened, of course, since Margaret Thatcher left office. We had 13 wasted years under Labour. Uh, Gordon Brown, who kidded the world, he was Flash Gordon, uh, the saviour of the global economy, was a chancellor who really frittered away Thatcher's achievements. My great fear when she stepped down was, oh, God, we're going to throw it all away. And I think we kind of did. The health service ballooned, public sector ballooned. Labour's answer to the problem of the UK economy was essentially throw money at the welfare state and let the bankers has run a mock, and we paid a very heavy well, well, price no, for no, that. I'm not going to pick you up on that, Neil, because I mean that was the things that she did with Big Bang, etc., in uh, the mid 1980s, 86, and that of course did propel Britain and London in particular as becoming the European financial capital at least. Now that unfettered, unregulated uh, industry, which gradually has, of course, had regulation creep up on it was uh, responsible what happened in 2008. And you could argue that that was a legacy to well, some extent. You could argue, but you'd be completely wrong if you argued it. Remember, no, I'm still the big, am, the even big, if I'm completely The wrong. big regulatory change in London was not Big Bang. It was Gordon Brown's reform that took away supervision from the Bank of England and gave it to a new financial services authority, which totally failed. So I think when, when one's trying to identify the causes of the crisis, it's not plausible to blame it on Margaret Thatcher. Margaret Thatcher brought about a renaissance of the British economy. The City of London was part of that renaissance, but the crisis, I think that lays, lies firmly at the door of the Labour government, uh, of uh, Tony Blair and Gordon Brown. Neil, I'm, I'm going to play devil's advocate again with you. I mean, look at manufacturing and how that was destroyed under under Margaret Thatcher in the early 1980s. Admittedly, a lot of these industries were highly inefficient. I grew up in manufacturing Britain in central western Scotland. Uh, my grandmother lived next door to a steelworks. I, I know what British industry was like in the 1970s. It was a disaster. Between the trade unions and incompetent management of nationalized industries, this was not a sector that you could save. The only way forward for Britain was a radical restructuring away from these defunct Rust Belt industries. And by the way, exactly the same thing happened 
happened in the United States in the same time frame. So no, I don't buy the idea that somehow if Arthur Scargill and Michael Foote had been in I'm power, we'd be an that. industrial powerhouse. I'm, I'm certainly not saying that. I'm just saying that what happened is that Britain does not have an industrial base, anything like it. Uh, like it did, even when it was efficient in the 1960s, perhaps arguably. Well, I mean, right. I'm not even sure that that's a compelling argument. One has to recognize the problems of British manufacturing go all the way back to the 1940s and beyond, and it wasn't something that Margaret Thatcher could turn around. Okay, let's then talk about, you've mentioned America there, and I think one of the enduring things were the, the relationship between Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher. Absolutely, this was a crucial relationship that ended the Cold War in many ways. Their determination to be tough with the Soviets in the early 1980s, when remember they were deploying short range and intermediate range nuclear weapons all across uh, Central Europe, that determination to be tough forced the Soviets into a rethink. They couldn't match the armaments expenditures of NATO, and that was what led ultimately to Mikhail Gorbachev. What's impressive about Reagan and Thatcher in that mid-1980s moment was the realization, which Margaret Thatcher had first, that you could do business with Gorbachev. That business was to end the Cold War and ultimately to destroy the Soviet Union. You know, when I think back to the 1980s, as a Thatcher supporter, the two things about which I'm really proud, one, the British economy was turned around, despite what the devil's advocates may say. But two, even more importantly, the Cold War ended with victory for the West. Not many people on the left in the 1980s were on the right side of that. Well, they believed in this convergence theory, didn't they, that everybody was looking the same by the or, end. Or unilateral nuclear disarmament. Yeah. Remember, many of my contemporaries at university in the early 80s were members of the campaign for nuclear disarmament. They wanted to give away the West nuclear capability, which would have been insane. So, no, she was completely on the right side there. And I think historians looking back in the 80s will say nobody contributed more to the end of the Cold War and to the West's victory than Margaret Thatcher. Uh, she was perhaps liked more abroad, wasn't she, than perhaps domestically? One of the wonderful things about Margaret Thatcher as Prime Minister was that she did not set out to be liked. She set out to address problems and she used to say, if, you aren't, if, you're, if you're not causing trouble, you're probably not solving the problem. She was somebody who did not shy away from a fight. She was never happier than when she was at the dispatch box in the House of Commons, swinging her handbag metaphorically at some opposition spokesman uh, or leader of the opposition. I, I think that was what made her a great leader. One of the things I found attractive, I was in my teens, 15 years old when she came to power, and a, an enthusiastic punk rocker, was that punk side of Margaret Thatcher. She was always up for a fight, and she was a tremendously tenacious fighter. She not only had to fight Labour, she also had to fight those uh, has-beens, the Social Democrats, and worst of all, the wets in her own cabinet. You know, looking back on it, the real opposition to Thatcherism were those old guard Tories who still clung to the corporate state of the 1960s and 1970s, the Heathites. And she never quite overcame them. Ultimately, I think they did for her. Uh, best Prime Minister, British Prime Minister since Winston Churchill? Certainly, and I think if you did a kind of uh, list of all the Prime Ministers that, that have been going way back beyond the 20th century, she would still come in at number two. Uh, Churchill, of course, is in a league of his own. That's wartime, though. Yep. He, de he defeated Nazi Germany uh, and I think deserves the accolade, saviour of his nation. But you know, Margaret Thatcher was also a saviour for Britain. And although she's not quite in the same league as Churchill, that's only because the historical circumstances were different. Well, she was also a wartime leader, wasn't she? We could argue too. She was indeed, and, and won her wars. Thank you very much indeed. Neil Ferguson.